In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today in our gospel reading, we are tossed into an onslaught. There's no helpful introduction to ease us into it. No, the reading begins and we are already halfway through a sermon, launched without preparation or context into what happens to be the most severe and dramatic part of some sort of list. Rulings, you might call them, on various topics. Jesus, of course, is the one speaking here. We're smack in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount, and he seems to be giving a kind of verbal commentary on a series of ancient sayings. And each part of this commentary follows a pattern. We can take the first few verses as an example. You have heard it was said of old, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be liable to judgment. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you, where have the disciples heard these things said? What is it that Jesus is referring to and commenting on? Well, you shall not murder is an easy one, right? It's the sixth of the original Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. But the others too, the commands which follow after this one that Jesus then goes on to talk about concerning recompense and reconciliation, lust and adultery, divorce and remarriage, oath-taking, promise-making. All of these, Jesus takes the originals from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, in which we read about God's calling of Israel and the subsequent revelation of the law. These aren't just any ancient sayings that Jesus is commenting on. They're God's sayings. They're God's laws given to a particular people in a particular culture to teach them in due time the difference between good and evil, and to help them choose the good. Now these original commands, however they might be clothed in some cultural distance, still on the whole make sense to us. Don't murder. Don't cheat on your spouse. If you get divorced, be fair about it. Don't swear if you don't mean it. Sure, we can get on board with those. But Jesus' commentary on the originals doesn't hit us in quite the same way, does it? His words sound wild, almost unhinged. I mean, we've got body parts flying into hellfire, people being tossed into prison to pay their debts. This isn't nearly as uplifting as the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Things have gone way downhill since blessed are the poor in spirit. What is it that Jesus is doing here? Well, there's no doubt that he's intensifying the common interpretation of these commands. And I think it's important to recognize the direction of the intensification. He's not just pushing the commands a few inches farther along the same track so that don't kill becomes don't hit, don't even flick. No. He's moving the commands inward, from don't do this thing to don't be this way. Righteousness, it seems, is more than doing righteous deeds. It's thinking rightly. It's feeling rightly. It's actually being holy, as God is holy. Now it's not only committing murder that makes one liable to judgment, it's just being angry, muttering an insult, calling someone an idiot, a fool. You have murdered them in your heart, Jesus says. The rage that curses a sister or brother is one and the same with the rage that points the gun, that pulls the trigger. Now it's not just sleeping with someone who's not your spouse that's wrong, it's simply looking at someone with lust, with that desire that seeks to grasp. You've committed adultery in your heart, Jesus says. 
In the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus takes the divine commands and moves the needle on what it means to obey them, revealing that not merely human deeds, but the human will itself is within the reach of God's justice. And it makes sense that Jesus would want to point this out in a way that it could not be avoided. At that time in Jewish culture, there was a law that could theoretically be followed. There was a charted way, at least ostensibly, to achieve righteousness. Think of the rich young ruler that Jesus encounters a bit later in the Gospels. In response to Jesus' reminder to this young man to keep the commands of God, the young man responds, all the commandments I have kept since my youth. Jesus' reply to that man is along the same lines as our passage today. He redefines obedience. He shows the shocking implications that truly following the commands of God would have on this young man's life. And the scriptures tell us the man goes away sad. And who can blame him? Sisters and brothers, if Christ's exposition of the law makes anything clear, it's this, that it's impossible to keep it. If we have been banking our spiritual success on our ability to follow the rules, today's gospel bankrupts us. For though many of us successfully avoid committing murder, we breed anger and resentment and disdain toward other human beings, all the time, do we not? Though literal adultery does not play a part in everyone's story, lust feeds like a worm on the human mind and heart, objectifying the human bodies around us, making them living pictures that exist for our pleasure. And what's even more startling about Jesus' teaching today is that he deems these hidden sins to be just as grievous, to count just as much, as the ones that everyone can see. Not one of us is clean. Not one is righteous. And this, this is troubling. Because when it comes down to it, I think Christians of the 21st century, and probably every century for that matter, have a profound commonality with some of those first century Jews. We wish we could do religion without God. I don't mean without church, without the liturgy, without hymns, even without prayer. I don't mean to say we aren't deeply committed to the forms of the faith, that we don't want to worship Jesus, but I wonder if on the whole we would prefer to worship the Lord without any uncomfortable reliance on him, without any true need of a power that is beyond us. We want to maintain a sense of moral control, of the perception of being in the driver's seat of our own salvation. We want to be good people, and we take comfort in the thought that we mostly are. We cling to it. Jesus' words today rob us of that delusion. We've been found out. Our lives have been turned inside out and shoved onto the stage, into the spotlight. But why? What's the purpose? Is it to make us feel bad? To fill us with guilt and shame? To inspire us, perhaps, to creative self-mutilation? Gouged out eyes? Cut off hands? I don't think so, friends. As Father Jonathan said to me earlier this week, do you think the kingdom of heaven is filled with blind and limbless people? Probably not. It's important for us to remember, friends, that though we might think this passage more suitable for Lent, we are still in the season of epiphany. The word epiphany means an unveiling, a revelation a sudden exposure of something essential and true. 
The season of epiphany in the church is marked by these moments of exposure, of revelation about the child mysteriously born among us at Christmas, the man who preached the Sermon on the Mount to us today. Who is he? Who is he to us? In Epiphany, we sit in this question. And I think today's passage answers this question yet again for us. It's another moment of exposure, of revelation. And it's not only you and I who are exposed here. It's not only you and I who are revealed in all our mess of complexity and brokenness. No, as the Lord Jesus expounds the law, as he unfolds the true reach of the will of God in us and for us, as he illustrates just how impossible it would be for us to achieve true holiness of our own devices, Jesus is revealed likewise. To be our hope. Our one stunning hope. The God who sees us to our depths. Who knows our infinite worth and our every confusion, our desire for good, and our ceaseless dance with sin. The God who sees every secret thought and every hidden deed, who knows what our eyes cling to, what our hands reach for, this God still loves us, still wants to be with us, still gives himself for us. This is my body, he says. It is for you. The definitive revelation of God in Christ, sisters and brothers, the climactic moment of epiphany when all is said and done is when the dead Jesus is hanging on the cross, having taken his place with low lives and murderers, having made even death and hell his own, having identified with sinful humanity even in the depths of our forsakenness, that he might overcome it at last. Jesus is God with us. That is who Epiphany reveals him to be, God with us. Us, the lost and the lustful. Us, the divorcees, and the angry, and the liars, and the murderers. And the deeply good news, brothers and sisters, is that he does not just keep us company here. He does not just cover us. No, when we cling to this Jesus, when we give up our delusion of control over and over again, when we reach in undisguised need for this Christ who is our life, we find that life is given to us anew. We become what we receive in his body, in his blood. We are caught up, as it were, in Christ's death and resurrection, members of his body, instances of the new creation, agency, freedom, true selfhood, the desire for good, the thirst for virtue, the hope of glory, all these things by our communion with Christ are perpetually awakened in us. And we are made able, able to grow in likeness with Christ, to love goodness, to hate evil, to forego anger, to know true beauty, to walk in love by Christ and with Christ and in Christ. We grow in virtue and holiness until at last we see the Holy One face to face. In that kingdom, which I do believe everyone will have their eyes, but we will only gaze on perfect beauty. And everyone will have their hands, but we will only reach in love. Amen.